okay we are live sir yeah good evening my dear brothers and sisters i am very pleased to meet all of you on a world hepatitis day this bro- program is brought to you by vgm hospital and whole medical academy of india uh, education support given by the redis lab today we got stalwarts in uh, hepatology and gastroenterology uh, professor Mo- vg mohan prasad uh, who needs no introduction is a stalwart in is good in communication not only medical even non medical is also good singer and of course uh, uh, dr joy vargis and then dr seth babu and the young and dynamic hepatologist mitra prasad uh, normally we have uh, you know didactic lecture but today for a change we want to have interaction i request all the participants you know to put your questions in the chat box and uh, any questions on uh, gastroenterology these uh, stalwarts can answer coming back to the today's topic you know to celebrate the world hepatitis day there are many ways of doing mohan always uh, prefers uh, you know morning a big marathon uh, to you know communicate to the public love your liver the topic today is love thy liver so you have to love your liver normally everybody loves heart and even for uh, addressing some sweet person honey person we say sweet heart but mohan always address all his good friends and sweet girls and sweet friends as my dear liver not my dear heart so that is the uh, spirit what uh, mohan has and today the world hepatitis theme of course you know you must bring the hepatic care near to near to you and also to the primary care because hepatitis or hepatic problem can be mostly prevented by good hygiene good pra- good lifestyle modification and good vaccination so prevention is better than cure applies to liver and liver is a good organ which has got a, is a liver is a factory imagine what all things liver does you take any any subject whether it is gastroenterology or endocrinology or cardiology or pulmonology liver has the role and the factory manufactures so many enzymes so many metabolisms are happening but again the liver is a very grateful organ it doesn't show any sign of failure unless you know uh, 50% or more than 50% you know get spoiled such a grateful organ so you must love the liver because you know so much the liver is doing for you then you should in turn love the liver one more uh, good i mean one more thing in this july month is the uh, muttulakshmi reddy she is she was born in uh, 30th july she is a padma bhushan awardee and she is the one who started cancer care hospital in adayar so all the liver cancer liver problems are solved by so many uh, hepatologists and we must remember her also on this day so with this uh, i think uh, the the, uh, the flow of event will be like this mohan prasad had seen a very interesting case in the morning which he discussed with me he is going to show that case to in the youtube the stalwarts can you know uh, give you your opinion and diagnosis even you are the delegates who are seeing the case you can give your opinion in the chat box so we will take the discussion uh, from there uh, we are not only going to discuss about hepatitis we can go we are, we are going to talk about alcoholic hepatitis not alcoholic hepatitis hep- hepatocellular carcinoma and then uh, uh, you know anything to do with gastroenterology also we will do and of course now we are happy hepatitis c has got a cure now treatment so so many good things are happening in uh, hepatology so with this basic background you know normally mohan is very clever he will ask me to speak first you know why you know people will log in very slowly and gradually so by the time i finish the hall will be full and everybody would have been there and again he will give me the opportunity in the last because you know everybody after the, you know listening to stalwarts they will go for sleep so that time only he will give me the podium but uh, for a change now i will be interfering in, in between also so with this uh, small background i request uh, professor vgm who can you know deliver a very big talk on any subject but now today only discussion he will show the case which he saw in the morning and uh, it's up to us to give our opinion over to you vgm please mohan please welcome dr mohan prasad uh, i my salutations to the moderator par excellence dr muruganathan and my dear esteemed colleagues uh, the brain behind all of us 
uh, in gastroenterology, Dr. Setu Babu, Dr. Joy Vargis, who brings a lot of joy whenever we meet him, and uh, my daughter, Dr. Mitra Prasad, who is uh, our hepatologist at uh, VGM uh, Hospital at Pimbaton. So, friends, uh, I'm very happy to present this case. It just hardly takes five minutes, but all of you can vote and uh, give your uh, you know, diagnosis on YouTube, which will be picked up uh, by the uh, admin and then passed on to us. A 71-year-old female who present, who was a case of known case of hypothyroidism, diabetic, coronary artery disease, LB dysfunction in uh, AF, presented with abdomen distension, pedal edema, breathlessness. The treatment, she was on uh, Jardian's Met, Galvas met Thyronorm, Diltiasm, Ecosprint. And during the workup, we found elevated alkaline phosphatase. And then patient, uh, you know, in view of uh, the uh, dyspnea, so we just did a HRCT. And, uh, you know, this patient had a CT of liver like this. This is a non-enhancing CT, just a plain CT of abdomen. This, uh, you see the date here, July 28th. Uh, this is done in our hospital. I blocked the name of the patient for uh, confidentiality. 77-year-old female. Now, so what is the diagnosis here? Is uh, what I would ask the audience to post their answers and uh, admin to pick up those answers and give it to us. Uh, before that, Mohan, why don't I ask Setu, what is his yeah. impression? Yeah, yeah can Setu. Yeah. So, okay, can, I, can I have the previous slide? The permit. No, previous slide, uh, we should not have shown it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> all right, I got the trick. Because that one says 71 and the x-ray says 77, so I want the correct age. Oh, That's no, okay. the correct age is 77, sir. 77. Fair enough, fair enough. Now, we are dealing with uh, an elderly woman with an SOL which is in an irregular hypoecoid. Now, the jumping diagnosis would be two always. One, are we dealing with a neoplastic lesion or as an inflammatory lesion? That's the basic approach to the entire problem. So, I think we need to do a little bit of biochemical workup before we jump into a radiological conclusion because we always correlate all these radiological SOLs with also biochemical. For example, we look at uh, for an SOL in liver, alpha fetoprotein as one of the reasonable dependable biomarker, which will help almost 80 to 85 percent of um, you know hepatocellular carcinoma does so significantly elevated. The second thing is we also need to know the, some more clinical features, like is the patient febrile? Is the patient, second thing is, is the patient has significant weight loss? Because this patient was shown to have, if I'm not correct, abdominal distension, we also need to find out what is the distance. The second is the liver also shows a few more SOLs as a correlative to the primary SOL, which is documented. So I would also, yes, that is the primary SOL. Yeah, these are the secondary satellites. So the obviously when you have multiple lesions like this, the first and foremost diagnosis comes as a neoplastic disease. Are we dealing with a primary neoplasm or secondary neoplasm is subjected to further work? Joy can take up. Yeah, Joy, Joy, uh, Joy yeah. before you take up, can you diagnose, uh, I mean, can you differentiate uh, yeah, malignant lesion from the inflammatory lesion by looking only at the uh, radiological image. Yes. Uh, can I can I talk, sir? Yes, sir. Please go ahead, Jai. Yeah. yeah fine. Uh, see, the, this is a non-contrast uh, CT images. So mm -hmm. the non using the non-contrast CT images very difficult to I mean differentiate the SOL and uh, either benign or malignant and other things. Considering this uh, patient's history, abdominal distension and the breathlessness, but if you look into that, uh, the, whatever the limited image, it doesn't show the much ascites or anything, and it shows the hepatomegaly. At the same time, whatever the upper region of the chest visible here, it shows the, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, not only the media stenum, it, it looks like uh, some uh, soft tissues uh, occupies the 
bilateral thorax actually it doesn't look like a mediastinum alone at the heart so we need the proper the ct chest as well as the echocardiogram and because the whatever the breathlessness and uh, it doesn't only it shows the hepatomegaly here uh, there is no much free fluid uh, whatever the visible cuts and uh, as is a non contrast whatever we are seeing the hypo dense lesion um, uh, very difficult to i mean uh, comment about it elevated alkaline phosphatase just uh, getting the history it might be due to liver or non liver also and uh, uh, we have to the elevated alkaline but mostly some sort of the infiltrative disease uh, we have to think based on this is my opinion Uh, thank you joy joy uh, any 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 uh, yes. inputs from can the I, can, uh, I, can i can i make one small request yeah. to joy what, yeah. are there satellite lesions sir i in this case no sir actually uh, you know joy uh, so no this one this lesion has not grown in size over 3 months this patient came to us today but then had an old ct 3 months back it is just the same and then we did the contrast and uh, this was uh, a, a, a hemangioma of the liver so in the tip with the typical uh, you know centripetal filling so from the periphery so this was uh, only a benign lesion but uh, you know i was uh, you know more curious about this uh, the liver so can you just talk about the rest of the liver you are all focusing on the soil so can you focus on the liver So he has But already pointed out hepatomegaly. Even the left lobe is uh, significantly. Uh, 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 of course, conventionally we would like to say that two things which commonly makes one is a fatty liver in in the early stage. The second one probably is a congestive hepatomegaly. But I am sure a contrast picture is much more uh, you know desired than just talking on plane. Okay. Even the I'm commenting on hemangioma and a plane as Joy has rightly put. is also not a you know yeah you need, we, we did you a need contrast, typical did, contrast feature yeah, we did a uh, contrast ct we we did a you know uh, triphasic yes. which showed that and uh, you know if i say this uh, 106 is a hounsfield unit now does it ring a bell are you thinking of something like an amyloidosis or something uh joy what is your difference so uh, i mean the main complaint the patient breathlessness i need a ct chest also and uh, with the iv contrast study yeah okay accepted now so this this turned out to be hemangioma so i'm not uh, but i what i wanted to focus was on this so you know like if this always happens you know if you put a piece of white paper put a one black dot everybody will focus only on the black dot likewise you know this sol was focused by our panelists but this is of great importance and interest because a rare finding that is why i thought i should present this case today to you so i'll show you i'll move on so this was a white liver because of amiodarone toxicity so this is a non enhanced ct which actually the 120 hounsfield units was the measurement normally hepatic parenchyma measures 50 hounsfield units the spleen attenuation is 58 hounsfield units if you see here uh, where is the spleen the spleen is not even in focus here but uh, you know like uh, this one was measured as 120 hounsfield units patient was an amiodarone uh, for 100 mg twice a day for 6 years with a cumulative dose of 4380 grams that is a you know 4380 grams cumulative over 6 months so amiodarone forms a compound with phospholipids within the mic- macrophageal uh, lysosomes and uh, these are protected from enzymatic breakdown by phospholipases and hence contributing to secondary phospholipidosis and uh, the reason for liver toxicity is uh, the hepatic damage or even it leads to we all know that it leads to cirrhosis it's a known side effect but no one knows why probably <coughs> because of iodine infiltration in the liver because of uh, chronic amiodarone usage some people say that is because of inhibition of mitochondrial beta oxidation that leads to production of ros reactive oxygen species and uh, you know 
uh, yeah, non-essential finding that reflects iodinated compound intake and parenchymal deposition. So this is amandarone toxicity, any cumulative dose of at least 380 degrees, 380 grams of amandarone is necessary to induce cirrhosis. But the new studies have shown even as short as one to two years, and the total doses as low as 55 grams, averaging only 280 grams may suffice. And it is a large apparent volume of distribution. Even after stopping this continuation, the total body stores do not decline for several weeks. This has to be remembered. And the only definitive treatment here is to stop the drug, but already damage is done as in this case. This is called the white liver sign. If you see here, there's a, a spleen here and you see the uh, liver. So this is 110 house speed units in this case and a, a spleen of 55 house speed units here. So this is uh, compared to the spleen, it is uh, double in dense. So if a CT scan, in a CT scan, the liver appears white. What are all the possibilities? One is amiodarone, other one all infiltrative disorders. Like I think uh, the panelists were talking about amyloidosis. Similarly, Wilson's disease, hemochromatosis, glycogen storage disease, all can produce such a white liver. So next time that you see a patient with, uh, you know, like uh, this uh, white liver, please think of all these possibilities. So this is today's case. So we were very quickly putting up this case just before presentation. So that is why I couldn't get you all the other pictures. I'm sorry about it. So, but uh, this is the case about. So and in this, uh, Morgan, in this uh, uh, white liver, is there any biochemical abnormality? What are the investigations which will, uh, you know, clinch other than the image? Is there any other biochemical abnormality? Yes, sir. Because they'll have, uh, you know, like uh, elevated liver enzymes, and with the development of cirrhosis, they'll have a reversal of AG ratio and all that. But nothing specific, sir. So, so that means, you know, everybody who takes samadhan, are they going to develop like this, or only few people who are sensitive or susceptible will get this? Sir, all those people who are on amiodarone probably have to be followed up. They have to be followed up for, uh, you know possible cumulative toxicity after one or two years. They should dose be related. Dose, re dose related. Dose related. Correct, sir. Uh, this weight, li weight liver sometimes may be, may be uh, without any symptom or will it definitely produce problems? Initially, no symptoms, sir. But uh, the amiodarone toxicity can lead to cirrhosis of liver. So, Joy and Mitra can also share their you know, thoughts on it. Yeah. Uh, this actually is uh, quite interesting. Uh, in the liver transplant, while doing the liver transplant, normally we will do the donor hepatic angiogram to assess the LAI. So, uh, Sir clearly mentioned the liver attenuation index time. Sometimes we have seen the, uh, the liver attenuation uh, would be very high. So, normally for the, the 50 pounds field instead of that, Sometimes it will show 80, 90. <coughs> that time our radiologist first question, they will call me and they will ask, sir, uh, is it a hemogromatosis or not? So this kind of a question, actually, usually we will get it from our uh, radiology colleague. So the main and another important point, what we learned, the amidorone history, also the one of the key, okay, because even if you are not seeing more of that one, mostly the cardiology side, they have to look in. So whatever uh, in our side, if you are going to look into that, we have to give an important for the uh, house field unit of the liver. Mitra, Mitra, can you just add on? Uh, so uh, nothing okay. basically to add on because we just picked this case up uh, today. We went back, asked the radiologist to uh, again look and tell us whether this is the white liver that we are actually seeing. So. Uh, yes, we found the cause and uh, probably it is a way to understand the cause for the cirrhosis in this patient. It's not a cardiac uh, cirrhosis, it should be due to amidarone toxicity. So that way we could probably pinpoint it. So. Dr. Mitra, I just may make a remark. Whenever a patient has got cirrhosis or fibrosis, but he also has an unusual hepatomegaly, we think of some of the possibilities, which includes diabetes, diabetic liver, amyloid liver, and, uh, you know, the typical amidaron liver. I think this is one favorite question. Uh, cirrhosis with epitomegaly. Wow. 
brilliant brilliant being an examiner so he's just giving some clues to the students thank you so much the sol is the sol is the confusing thing actually yes, yes. that is why i put it up i you put a, yeah yeah very nice i mean it it's probably in in 48 hours we would have made the diagnosis but you gave us the challenge for 4 to 10 minutes so we you, i thought you will ask questions on sol actually like there's this patient we did the ct only today sir no no we 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 actually go back to the radiologist trouble him and he will start telling with you know you look at the liver it is not the fair liver and you know this actually if you see the real x ray they are much more brighter whiter than what you actually have shown they will be really much more whiter I yeah i agree with you. nice nice uh, stimulation for us thank you so much sir over to dr muruganathan sir to start as a moderation of panel discussion today in uh, connection with the world hepatitis day today the 28th of july every year we observe we also have organized from vgm foundation and whole medical academy which is run by dr muruganathan you know every day whole medical academy runs uh, teaching programs i think he has crossed several thousand programs an unimaginable uh, level of energy muruganathan sir you are a teacher par excellence and you been uh, the past national president of api and yeah, then you also been uh, uh, in the college of physicians the dean of college of physicians you have held so many positions uh, innumerable and all the time dedicated to teaching so over to dr muruganathan our moderator to yeah th- th- thank you mohan uh, the more important uh, designation is i am very close to all of you that's the most uh, important thing which i cherish okay we'll start with we'll start with uh, mitra sir before before we move on uh, we have yeah. to introduce our uh, speakers today uh, this one of the senior most uh, you know hepatologists and gastroenterologists in the country is uh, professor dr setu babu who's from uh, krishna institute of medical sciences hyderabad he is a brilliant brain and uh, you know all conferences we invite him to get his comments is only, only questions only questions only questions synthesizes thoughts and gives phenomenal uh, all questions are very tricky even the uh, you know the international speakers are scared to uh, answer uh, setu's questions so amazing brain a lot of teaching and it, it is also uh, on the panel of uh, specialty board for the national board of exams he is an examiner and uh, he sets up question papers and all that amazing uh, great human being and a great friend to all and is also recently published a book on liver and uh, you know joy is uh, joy vergees has been with uh, uh, glen eagles global hospital in chennai you know doing phenomenal work in the liver transplant work in, as a transplant hepatologist so he has been a good friend of mine almost for uh, one and a half or two decades and doing phenomenal work there a lot of publications a lot of good work so these two are phenomenal uh, faculty members and then to join them is uh, my own daughter dr mitra prasad our our own hepatologist who just uh, you know uh, you know like what to say uh, a budding uh, you know flower so very soon uh, will produce so, a, yeah. uh, you know blossom to a fragrant flower very soon so it's just starting her career so yeah one one more introduction about uh, mitra today's case she only diagnosed and told mohan Right. and uh, mohan only borrowed the knowledge from mitra yeah uh-huh. that is a, that is the information i want to give that's fact factual sir yeah that's what okay now we'll start with uh, mitra in your uh, uh, you know experience the hepatology uh, what is most interesting in hepatology yeah, because you have become an hepatology in the in the, in the past uh, few years so what is most interesting and attractive in hepatology so the most interesting thing i find is a lot of systemic problems also come in uh, masquerading as liver diseases so that way they become diagnostic challenges rheumat rheumatology i mean you know uh, all the connective tissue disorders autoimmune states everything together uh, infiltrative diseases infectious diseases chronic infectious diseases all of them become a, a a real diagnostic challenge which can probably be picked up with very simple uh, liver function tests clues so that part of it plus plus i think a biopsy whenever is necessary 
So um, all that picked up at the right time uh, earlier would probably help the patient a long way. So that yeah. Is Excellent. Excellent, excellent, Mitra. This is what I expected from you. Sedu Babu, we'll start with a formal question. What is the theme of the World Hepatitis Day today, Sedu? Uh, actually, it was actually the birthday of Dr. Professor Bloomberg. He was the okay. man who incidentally diagnosed Hepatitis B. And from there onwards, out of respect to him, we actually celebrate and take this opportunity to spread the awareness of uh, hepatitis, its transmission and its prevention. Three very interesting remarks I want to make is a transition. Uh, you know, when I was a medical student, we were all taught only cirrhosis of liver. I don't know any other word. Today, we, of course, talk end-stage liver disease. And, uh, you know, I think that's a better word that is used. Indian childhood cirrhosis, I don't know what, it just disappeared. Joy would make a comment on that. It just disappeared. Then there was an era when probably another second decade where we were talking only hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Thanks to the wonderful vaccination produced in India and then hepatitis C fantastic therapy. We, by the time we realized uh, we got such wonderful drugs easily available in this country. To make it point amazing, one tablet of a sofasabvir was costing around $1,000 has made almost to you know less than 100 rupees. Unbelievable. I still remember when I saw the tablet, I was amazed in abroad. Then we got into an another era, that is we are now talking about NASH, NAFL, and uh, it's related cirrhosis and it related HCC. ASH has been a perennial problem to all of us. As the drinks grow, we also grow, and it's, uh, it's one which keeps us uh, you know, viable for us. Now we are identifying a focus of drug-induced liver injury, a small group, uh, but we have been very careful. We are trying to warn everybody and probably the prevention is monitoring is the best. And SOLs of liver, which is always a challenge, like the one SOL which has shown is turned out to be hemangioma. But I think our first uh, always conscious is, are we dealing with a HCC or so? So there is a huge transition that happened. Uh, sir, yes. today, yes. adding, on, adding on, sir, today we saw a patient who had uh, for no reason developed a mild uh, uh, jaundice, 2 milligram bilirubin, a lady who is uh, 70 years old, with uh, elevated liver enzymes, a five-fold elevation of the transaminases, that's all. So liver, uh, you know, uh, ultrasound was normal. And then the other parameters are normal. Uh, and uh, the history showed that the patient was on some Agastya Rasayana for uh, almost like a year for a lot of uh, herbal uh, you know concoctions Options. she was taking so setu babuji uh, ideally you know like very clearly told that daily drug induced liver injury has to always be remembered so whenever we take a history i think a complete history taking is of paramount importance both ayurvedic siddha homeopathy unani allopathy everything has to be properly jotted down otherwise we miss the bus so <laughs> And, uh, you know, when uh, Setuji was uh, speaking, uh, I remembered the WHO theme, bring hepatitis care closer to you. That is the theme for this year, uh, for World Hepatitis Day given by WHO. Bring hepatitis care closer to you, which means they're aiming at eradication of hepatitis B and C by 2030. Stop hepatitis B and C 20, by 2030 was the earlier slogan. I think they're all really trying to fight these two diseases. But as uh, Dr. Muruganathan was pointing out, as Dr. Setu Babu was pointing out, now the alcoholic liver disease is on the rise. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease because of obesity metabolic syndrome is really on the rise. We really have to watch out for these two. Over to the moderator. Yeah, thank you, Morgan. No, as Mitra started, liver is a fantastic organ. Whatever uh, you know, you do, liver takes the first brunt. Even if you take too much of alcohol, even if you take too much of drug, even if you take too much of fat, liver only gets affected. So liver is such a good organ, you know, protects. Uh, Jai, what is your view about liver? Because Mohan loves the liver. You know, the topic is die, love thy liver. So why do you love your liver? Why? What are the special things about liver? Please, Jai. Because you always, you always steal liver from other people also. We always steal heart from other people, but you always steal heart, uh, liver from other people. So tell me what, something about liver. So it's, uh, it's generally I used to tell to the public. Uh, 
so unlike uh, cardiac disease or the stroke neuro problem so uh, it can occur at the uh, uh, immediately and the, if you are not addressing quickly uh, that will cause the i mean increasing the mortality but if you take a liver uh, except the acute liver failure that is very very small percentage most of the liver disease if you take whatever the etiology either alcohol induced or fatty liver or autoimmune disease or genetic liver disease vascular cause whatever it is it is a very slow process so the liver disease always is a uh, irrespective of the etiology the cause very very slow process if we know the disease little bit early stage we can easily control the end organ problem uh, and uh, the the liver is a good uh, the regenerative capacity if you are properly diagnosing and if you are identifying the cause and if you are controlling that progression so there is more chances of liver regeneration and we can avoid it. that's the one peculiar thing in uh, liver disease so that's the main reason i mean uh, everyone has to know that this is the world hepatitis day but uh, as uh, i mean we are, we are discussing about not only the viral hepatitis we should know about the other causes for the liver injury and the earlier we identifying and uh, taking the steps it will 100% it will avoid the end organ damage okay uh, now uh, said babu uh, we'll start with hepatitis a normally we say hepatitis a nothing to worry hepatitis e we nothing to worry is there anything about hepatitis a which you want to drive home a message yeah i think interestingly what happens the safe water supply and the disease awareness hygiene in fact made hepatitis a and e almost uncommon joy would make this comment that we stopped seeing acute viral hepatitis due to a and e maybe they are there in some remote places but certainly not coming to the main hospitals or tertiary cares the second one is it is something like all or none majority of them let me say almost 90% of them afflicted with a or e do recover with some supportive care and uh, a small number of people just for academic reason uh, hepatitis may a e may be given rebavirin but that's all probably a scientific feat but majority of them reverse but very rarely they develop acute liver failure and that is where the whole problem comes and once they develop acute liver failure they almost uh, you know go up to transplant they end up in transplant otherwise they die so what we today still advocate to prevent a and e uh, most important is water and hygiene we do have a hepatitis a vaccine but it is not scheduled in the universal immunization as a vaccine but if somebody goes to dr joy or me or somebody else should i take a vaccine a we always tempted to say why don't you take i mean we don't have a strict guidelines joy would also comment on about hepatitis a vaccine whether every child should be given joy can joy, you say joy, joy, joy. hepatitis a vaccination in selected group only i mean in practice we are uh, advising yes. not for uh, all the group because the uh, vaccine the potency it is not the lifelong immunity particularly a compensated chronic liver disease that time we usually advisable along with the hepatitis b vaccine other than in practice i am not recommending for the a vaccination but best but always better is the the hygiene hand hygiene and that will be much better the tool the prevention of the a and the e virus in india uh, uh, now mohan 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 is known for hepatitis b vaccination because when i was the rotary governor we gave 1 lakh dose and we got a very competitive rate from the uh, shila biotech or some hyderabad and, and we Shanta gave uh, shada bhai we gave so many people so your experience on i mean uh, vaccination in the b and also what is uh, hepatitis b what is the problem about hepatitis b if you don't treat properly uh, sir be- before i start my comment on b i thought i should also add a, a beautiful point setu babu ji put it up put up in the whatsapp message so he said see those days 
there was so much of water pollution now it is much much better the water borne hepatitis a and e are reducing in a great way see uh, in the 90s you know like i have been in practice of gastroenterology hepatology for 35 years in 90s we had a severe outbreak of hepatitis a in uh, you know in, in one hostel of nurses uh, of one of the uh, you know corporates here 80 nurses developed acute hepatitis a multiple lot of patients uh, who were uh, from ooty uh, metapalayam all that belt had hepatitis a which uh, we used to see in within 3 months i saw probably uh, some 200 300 cases of hepatitis a acute hepatitis a and along with that e also came so these were all water borne outbreaks uh, you know which we did not document otherwise it would have gone in the history so yeah, say to say the wants to say something yes say though and i think our experience with uh, this water borne hepatitis was fantastic we published two papers in liver international because that was a study which was done by the all india institute the 71 crp but crp of battalion when they were getting trained in vaga border all of them developed hepatitis at that time we divided these people into two groups we stayed in the camp for 5 days and uh, we gave one set of people immunoglobulin and the other set we didn't give anything but nothing happened it's not protective and uh, a is in children e is in adults you can get small communities of uh, e hepatitis related the only very important problem that we need to understand is some of the e patients maybe maybe there is some small data that they may require oral medication hepatitis a no medication is required majority of them recover and one one more common thing you know how they develop hepatitis you know morgan prasad used to say when you go to even five star hotels if the salads are taken you know sometimes the salads are washed in a dirty water you know salads look looks good but they would have washed in the water and that also can cause hepatitis so we more and always say uh, beware of taking some you know be careful when you take salads more and uncooked uh, foods like chutney yeah. juices buttermilk and salads i would like to view with suspicion so those days you know even one of the five star hotel chefs i was interacting with he said how do you purify water he says it goes through some copper tube and comes out that's it this is i'm talking about 30 years back but today you know like uh, with so much of water purification systems all five star hotels probably are safe unless they and also the chefs also because of lot of stringent rules for hand wash and uh, use of gloves and so many things i think the five star uh, you know uh, hotel restaurants are much much safer but outside in marriage houses and other places whenever uh, anyone eats they should probably avoid uncooked food then probably can escape from these uh, you know water borne uh, hepatitis and continuing with hepatitis b it was actually shanta bai technique where setu ji is also a director on the board it was uh, padma bhushan varaprasad reddy with whom over a phone call i could get the vaccine cost reduced because at that time the uh, you know multinational company was selling it at 750 rupees a dose so a pediatric dose and 1200 an adult dose for hepatitis b vaccine then you know like i spoke to him and requested him my see if we as a rotary project as uh, past district governor muruganathan was talking about we need to vaccinate 100000 children so with uh, three doses ultimately you know 300000 doses but ultimately we landed up giving 1 million doses uh, within a span of one year in uh, 12 rotary districts that became possible because just over a phone call uh, padma bhushan varaprasad reddy said uh, how many doses do you want i said i want uh, 300000 doses uh, what cost you are looking at uh, dr prasad he asked uh, i said sir Uh, i was so hesitant i asked sir is it possible to give it at 40 rupees a dose a pediatric dose that's what i asked him very humbly with so much of fear because um, the cost was so high even shanta bai technique vaccine was costing at that time 350 rupees a pediatric dose so immediately you, you know he said dr prasad i will give you at 40 rupees and i'll go one step further that will include a syringe for 2 rupees and 8 rupees central sales tax cst at that point of time so we will absorb everything he said so that was such a magnanimous show and then i invited him here and thanked him in press of in, in the presence of press and media a few years back when i got uh, 
13,500 children under one roof for the World Hepatitis Day. That was uh, 2013. We honored it. So that is a story simply to put across. But the, the moral of the story is wherever possible, we should vaccinate people against hepatitis B. So three doses have to be taken. One dose now, one dose after 30 days, and the third dose after six months, 180 days. Is uh, yeah. Setu, I, I think we had lot of struggle. Not required to have three doses. Is it right? Yeah, no. We, we, we had a struggle uh, presenting a paper in the planning commission. I was there with Varapasar and then we have to convince the government to put it in the universal immunization. They readily agreed and uh, they, because the government, has, once you put it in universal immunization, they have to buy the vaccine and he gave as low as 20 rupees to the government. Wow. This is in the book. Wow. Yeah, he, that was the way we purchased it. And uh, even day before I was with him uh, for a function. And again, we recapitulate whenever we meet the struggle. And we both were actually standing at uh, Delhi Planning Commission office for almost three, four hours to meet these people with all their questions, ICMR director and all. We remember those struggles. Ultimately, today it saw the, and today export seems to be much more exciting than, and it became a standard of care and all pediatricians have universally accepted. And what is very interesting is it used to be around three to 4%, though the statics weren't hundred percent correct, but we believe we probably Mohan Joy would all agree that it is possibly the, it has come down to as low as 1% and the vertical transmission has almost disappeared now. I think we are only talking a one-to-one -one spread and very, very rare. I think rural, a little bit of misuse of blood and other products, but otherwise in now it became screening and transfuse and vaccinate, I think made actually hepatitis B and the hepatologists have no big work on these areas. They are now not getting, you know, that so-called chronic hepatitis, chronic active hepatitis, chronic persistent hepatitis, all these things. Even to me, Joy would say, even HCC, is, is it slowly disappearing in that particular group? HCV got disappearing with the wonderful medication. HBV got disappearing. I think even HCC in that particular uh, cohort is disappearing. Yeah, thank you, Joy. Uh, is there any other uh, schedule? Uh, Mohan Prasad said three doses. Is there any two-dose schedule or four-dose schedule uh, in other countries? Uh, actually, if the patients are not getting adequate antibody, that time we can think about the one more dose, double the dose. Suppose, uh, I mean, this particularly for the healthcare provider, the chance of uh, getting that the antibody titer sometime will not be that much adequate what we are expecting more than 100 IU. So that time, one more booster dose or the double the dose is fine. And sometimes we are seeing the patient, those who are on the dialysis, the hemodialysis, they will be on. So they won't get adequate antibody titer. That time, the three doses might not be sufficient. Those who are on hemodialysis groups, that time also they might require the, the, uh, the repeated the dosage. And uh, regarding the hepatitis B, if you look into that, if you take in Tamil Nadu, we are seeing uh, some pockets of that area, the hepatitis B prevalence is slightly higher. Particularly, I have seen the coastal region, the fishermen area. So uh, the patients, those who are coming, still we are seeing that uh, uh, the clusters, I mean, the one family member, uh, so many, the brothers, sisters, so many will have the positive and uh, Thani, Kambam, that area in Ramnad district. Uh, so, and uh, particularly the, the coastal region, uh, Kanyamari, uh, that area we are seeing uh, more uh, the hepatitis B positivity. Uh, that is my opinion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah Mitra, because I, we, we have to involve Mitra, Vijayam. Yeah. Mitra, uh, is there any possibility of, you know, uh, hepatitis B spreading through barber shop or head saving? Definitely, uh, the spread in hepatitis B is manifold higher than HIV or HCV uh, through uh, either needle exposure or razors or uh, definitely barber shops also. So, okay. all uh, of those are uh, areas uh, that need to be... And in, intrafamilial spreads or intra-household spreads are well known. Uh, Basic Practice Institute Taramani did studies in Chennai 
and found if one member of a family is positive one another one out of four will be positive so which is uh, because of sharing of the comb toothpicks razors uh, you know probably nail clippers all those areas where some trauma can happen to the skin or uh, scalp or whatever can spread so people have to be you know if one member is positive all members have to be screened and vaccinated and in fact the three dose vaccination schedule was you know tried after several trials people uh, like uh, setu babu brought out these uh, you know the schedule because with one shot see what we give is the antigen of the b virus which which is without a virion so it's only the surface coat which is uh, you know like uh, in, you know like uh, prime i mean grown in e coli i think it replicates and then it's taken harvested and injected so once you inject the uh, you know our uh, you know the macrophages the uh, antigen presenting cells they take it and present it to the b cells and the b cells will keep a memory there they become the memory cells and then and when the second dose is given immediately the b cell clone replicates and they start producing antibodies and then again as the antibody titers keep falling down one more uh, booster then it boosts up then any antibody titer of above above 100 international units is supposed to be protective but then we usually expect at least 1000 uh, international units which can give an immunity at least for 5 years what people say is even if the antibodies become undetectable after a period of 5 years or 10 years if there is a you know contact with the virus or with one more booster immediately the antibodies go off so that's what we do we want if somebody wants to know am i protected just give a shot after one month check the anti hps if the anti hps status are in low levels not unprotective levels below 100 then continue that vaccination as though that was the first dose which was given previously the second dose uh, at that stage and then another dose after two months and then six months or six months maybe a double dose depending on as joy was pointing out whether immuno compromised or ckd whatever a higher dose of instead of 20 microgram you give 40 milli 40 micrograms or a, a closer booster 0 1 2 and 12 so that sort of a modified vaccination schedule can be followed thank you mohan uh, sedu all these things are uh, all these things are very interesting but why not in hepatitis c why there is no vaccine for hepatitis c Yeah, that was the difficult. Basically, uh, DNA vaccines are easy to produce, uh, but RNA vaccines are very difficult to produce because the virus is unstable. Actually, it goes on changing the structure. Now, that was one reason we could not get even HIV vaccine, which is a partial DNA, to that extent. It didn't behave like a true DNA. If you see HBV DNA, you see HCV RNA, and you see HIV. partial dna the integration was quite different uh, hepatitis b integrates with the host nucleus hepatitis c integrates only with the cytoplasm whereas there is a partial integration by the hiv virus that the vaccine even for hiv was so incomplete because they could not produce the effective antibody though there were little bit of neutralizing antibodies but they were not lasting long so we actually failed in hcv because we could not produce disease protective antibodies for this particular virus mm. experiment on animals in fact i was studying couple of years back about the failure of hcv and we did lot of homework uh, at shanta biotech and they tried also but they were all unstable and they could not produce the required vaccine and the response to the so called experimental animal dose was so inadequate so basically one difference is that this is not a true dna which responds like anything it's predominant rna virus that's why there could not be any vaccine but the story was something surprising with uh, you know covid which is uh, superb i think uh, we need to mention the phenomenal work done globally and particularly in india even though it is an rna virus we could produce I, I, i was about to i was about to ask that question sedu uh, knowing that you have answered yes please go ahead now the 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 probably the viral structure and the amino acids have so much of difference the virus is more complex whereas uh, covid is such a, not a really complex uh, that way 
uh, what it produced, I think it's for a criticism, what devast it produced and uh, so secondary infections, pulmonary fibrosis, they're all secondary events. So today the, in the history of vaccine, much more than hepatitis B, COVID has really showed that uh, the research is super fast and it can be produced. Now, people have relooked into a very latest publication, which was shown that there is a hope to get a HCV vaccine very soon. That study is a molecular biological basis. It was published in one of the journals of hepatology. And there is a way probably down the line in about five years we might get. Then what happened in particular HCV is it, the disease is not as uh, like HBV is easily transmissible. And we are able to take, this, for example, the transmission is hematogenous. We're able to take care. That is why probably the HCV incidence is not that high as HBV. Second is uh, the treatment is so simple. Suppose somebody comes with HCV, I'm not worried. I give two drugs or three drugs and we can totally eradicate. Whereas in HBV, See, because the virus integrates with the nucleus, the so-called CCC DNA integration, we are never able to get out of the virus. And all of us are worried about a future malignancy, even though you have been putting them on antiviral for a very long time. So HBV is always needs a follow-up. HCV, you can do a partial follow-up. Thank you. Uh, actually, nowadays, you know, they are converting RNA into DNA and DNA to RNA and then do a lot of things to, you know, uh, to get the vaccine. Joy, tell me the treatment of hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Uh, uh, Sedu says uh, hepatitis C treatment is simple. So tell me what is the treatment you give for hepatitis C? The hepatitis C nowadays, the fantastic, the oral drugs are available. But before to start the therapy, only we should look into that whether the good ultrasonogram or the fibro scan or even sometimes CT abdomen we can take to rule out underlying fibrosis or underlying cirrhosis are there. That is very important before to start the hepatitis C virus treatment. Because the, the imaging, either ultrasonogram or fibro scan or CT, if it shows the normal liver, then only we can give the treatment as a monotherapy, single pill drug for the three months. So we can give it the medications. So it's available as the combination of the velpotaspin with the sofosbovir combination. But in case, if that, if by giving this one, if you're giving almost more than 99 percentage of the sustained virological response, that means the cure rate with the newer oral antiviral drug. But if the imaging, one of the imaging modality shows the fibrosis, then the response of the therapy will not be that effective. And uh, that time, either two, two ways, either we can add a ribavirin therapy along with the sofosbovir with the velpotaspin, that combination for a three months therapy. Otherwise, we can give the same uh, without the ribavirin for six month therapy. But if you look into the literature, if the already patients got a cirrhosis, uh, because we know what is cirrhosis, the F4, beyond F4 fibrosis, F2, F3, okay, even though fibrosis somehow the sustained virological response by adding either ribavirin or extending the therapy for three more months, the reports are slightly good. But if you look into that the cirrhosis, only the sustained virological response will come between the 60 percentage to the 70 percent between 65 66 so that group uh, need a close monitoring because us they won't get the that's much uh, the svr uh, that means the cure not by the newer drug that group closely we have to monitor we have to repeat the cv rna and at that time the other drugs are available but it is all are imported it is unfortunately, it is not available in India. Those who are not responded very well with the current existing drug. So that the one is the costly and uh, very few of our patients has received uh, the kind of the resistant group uh, things. Uh, Joy? Thank you. Thank can you. I, Thank you, Joy. Yeah. yeah, please. Yeah, please. Yeah. The ribobiron now used to be previously so freely available. Now it has become more and less and less available now, especially after COVID. I think the 
uh, import of ribavirin from France or China has become a challenge now because all the imports were uh, focused on COVID supplies and things like that. So if ribavirin is not available and, uh, you know, like a genotype 3 with high fibrosis, how do you treat so the, we have to extend the therapy for the another three more months, you know, not six a three-month therapy. Six months it takes. For six six months. Months. But even, yeah, even with the six-month therapy, suppose if the patients, the viral mode is not able, we are not able to achieve the SVR, at present uh, there is no other option. Uh, but <laughs> if you look into that earlier, I mean, before the oral antiviral drug era, uh, we have used, uh, I mean, I'm sure I mean, we all we have the, the fantastic experience with the uh, regulator interferon, the combination. So even that drug also, unfortunately, it's not that much uh, because of side effect and the, uh, the SVR rate is less. We are not trying, but a few of our patients, we have tried that one. Those who are not responding with uh, explaining the proper, so the earlier drugs, regulator interferon. Sedu, Sedu, Sedu wants to say something. Sedu? Actually, I, uh, Joyce told my statement. Uh, some yeah. of these people uh, who did not respond to dual therapy of uh, Sufsevir and uh, Pelpatsevir or triple therapy where we had added Vaxeloprevir. So I think they might respond to pug interferon. Somehow, uh, hepatitis C did not become a major problem what we envisaged. I was excited that my hepatology practice would jump up 100-fold with hepatitis C therapy, diagnosis, and we talk about RNA viral load. You know, whenever we speak in the market, we'll say 1 lakh, 2 lakhs, 3 lakhs, as if it's a share market. But suddenly, when we found that the drug, you know, the usage is so fast, uh, Joy would agree that dual therapy is so effective in all these people. Even reasonably Indian genotype 3 reasonably respond. You add a triple drug, they respond very well. Or you can import the other complex. Somehow our patients did not require the kind of, uh, you know, US, UK data talk about hep C treatment. There was a period when for about three, four years, uh, we had some discussion with Patrick Kamath and Professor Reddy. Uh, they talk so much about hep C. Uh, we were actually a little humble in talking about hep C. So I think it isn't a major problem that everybody said. We should be able to treat almost 90% of the cases with the available drugs. Uh, yeah, sir, Morgan. Can I add here, sir? Like we published yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Morgan, please. 1,200 uh, patients of Hep C North South East West, four center study, which was presented as a poster in ASLD, now went for publication. That one, uh, you know, like we showed that this is a real life scenario. 96% uh, clearance of the virus with the just the sofosbuvir and belpatasvir combo. 96% clearance. And out of the 3-4%, uh, they were uh, difficult to treat. Like uh, sometimes uh, genotype 3 is a responder relapser. It responds and after 3 to 6 months again gets comes back. Some, it need not be all the time non-responder. So, and uh, you know, like uh, cirrhosis patients, sometimes, you know, those sort of patients were about only 4%, 96% complete cure. And that is the beauty of C. It doesn't come back. We always confirm after three months and or six months, we do an RNA and it has to be negative. The HCV RNA uh, by qualitative PCR is good enough. And uh, this is the only way to prevent human to human transmission until the virus uh, vaccine comes in. Because in 1994 itself, I saw the candidate vaccine being presented in the Rome conference, uh, A2E conference. And a five-day conference with beautiful studies from all over the world, including some of the American universities, are so excited that the HCV vaccine was ready. But then, see, today we are in 2022. 30 years, 28 years down the line, we still don't have a vaccine. Because it keeps on replicating, uh, you know, uh, so rapidly, and it keeps on mutating. So it's like a bag of cousins. We don't, they don't uh, look alike, uh, they're not similar looking viruses. So that is one big challenge in HCV. But as uh, Setuji put it, I think uh, there are uh, probably uh, looking like light at the end of the tunnel. So, but we'll have to see. So, yeah, Mitra, we have talked about uh, easy diagnosis, easy treatment of vitamin, I'm sorry, hepatitis C. What about hepatitis B? Even after so many years, 
still you are having a lot of problem with hepatitis b so tell me how do you approach hepatitis b suppose somebody has got hepatitis b and if they come to you what do you do the percentage in positive what do you do yeah so once they come in with hepatitis b uh, uh, report of hbs ag positive so uh, right now the guidelines are more towards is looking at whether hb e antigen is positive or negative we are of course seeing more of the antigen negative patients and in those patients we look at the hbv dna to see whether it is more than 2000 in e antigen negative or more than 20000 in e antigen positive patients or if they are they fall in between this or you have a doubt then we approach them with a fibro scan or an, an, an ultrasound plus a fibro scan if they still have significant fibrosis and if they have an enzyme elevation also amt of more than uh, one to two times the upper limit of normal then we go in for uh, treating these patients so the drugs that are currently um, used by far are uh, our conventional tenofovir tdf and the taf both have come in and the entecavir in a subgroup of uh, patients and maybe children so this this is how it is uh, but can you say after your treatment hepatitis b is cured no Hep- uh, hepatitis b is uh, said to babu sir wants to have No, no, no. You, you please I, answer. I, I, yeah, you, you answer, answer, then I will answer. answer. Yeah, you yeah. answer. Hepatitis B, we still uh, don't have a functional cure that is readily available. So um, we do go by lifelong treatment. So though guidelines do say some scenarios you can consider stopping treatment, I don't think we do that by now. Say do, say do, sir. Please say do. Yeah, I think uh, I, I was very impressed with the study which was published in Hepatology. few months back and they said if you give for four years and if the viral suppression for one year is hit there probably their relapse rate is very low it's very impressive but that's a smaller number but i would agree i pick up the word from uh, our madam and say that yes the treatment is probably lifelong but what is very important joy also would support my statement saying that still these people need monitoring for hcc viral suppression alone is not uh, you know the cure and you just don't have to tell now your dna is undetected so you are perfectly all right is never it. because a small number suddenly come to you after 7 8 years and said sir we have been taking even now but then why did i develop a liver sol and then we are scared worried and everything so i think the caution which uh, is lifelong treatment with an antiviral and they, today there are also studies which say maybe the first line of drug is uh, tenofovir even you don't have to think of entecavir or there are few studies which joy would agree if they were on entecavir till you know yesterday and today if they come to you skip to from entecavir to tenofovir because of the slightly effic- better efficacy the efficacy is about 10 to 15% more than entecavir so tenofovir seems to be the sole drug of choice earlier it was dipivoxil and now we have changed it to alfenamide and we found it reasonably safe very rare to get all those lactic acidosis and all we don't see uh, i am sure joy and vgm will ascertain my statement uh, along with the madam that the treatment of hbv is lifelong and he needs to be monitored for a hcc are the two very important statements take home messages okay so you mean to say uh, say to say to babu Somebody, somebody has got HB. I mean, B. They can also have C. Also, yeah. This is a funny combination. I think what happened is uh, some of those HB B who went into multiple procedures and particularly hospitalized group. This is abroad. Drug addicts have this kind of problem. Dual infection. They have, in fact, triple infection. We had one or two such patients in the last ten years. HB B, HCV, HIV. you know and uh, the then we pick up at least smile and say tenofovir is a common drug so at least you have one common drug so i think these okay. combinations are and un- unfortunately uh, joy would also make the statement that these combinations are much less burden for us uh, vg uh, mohan you want yeah all all patients of uh, oncology undergoing cancer chemotherapy should be screened uh, for hepatitis b as antigen and also probably the antibody also right so anti core antibody or anti uh, yeah anti core antibody uh, total so which cells that have been exposed to the virus at some point of time 
in that case probably prophylactic uh, you know antivirals might be indicated or at least vaccination and all that should be considered much before starting on uh, immunosuppressive therapy or uh, cancer therapy so otherwise they run into a severe life threatening acute uh, hepatitis which could be even a, a permanent and can cause the life so it yeah, is we'll... not mentioned sorry sir uh, yeah. pediatric uh, hematological malignancies are one of the because they respond very nicely but they get secondary infection we had few referrals uh, from pediatric oncology and these people because they get multiple transfusions hemophilix for example and you know these are the people who has to be very carefully monitored and one somewhere one small infection of a prick would be sufficient so these people should be cautioned as mohan rightly said yeah now we'll uh, i'll ask you only short questions because we have finished most of the hepatitis uh, you know a b c e also now we'll go one by one joy uh, what about fatty liver people think fatty liver is not a big thing to worry but what is your view now about the fatty liver uh, yeah usually it was considered as a benign disease but nowadays uh, even though it is a benign in most of the groups 15 to 16% of the individual the fatty liver slowly will progress to the nash the inflammation then fibrosis and cirrhosis and the liver cancer so my suggestion all the fatty liver suppose if you are going for a regular checkup if you identified the fatty liver we have to look into that uh, what are the precipitating factors we have and uh, the patient or patient have so the common is the diabetes or dyslipidemia or hypothyroidism overweight so we have to try to find out the what are the precipitating factor and that precipitating factor related to the proper medications everything is very important and uh, if you see the literatures and now the cardiology society also has agreed or the they have started to screen even though there is no consensus to statement to to whom to the, do the coronary screening or anything but to most of the yeah, fatty liver patients is they are the more prone to get the cardiac uh, disease in even the younger age so uh, but to whom to screen for coronary that is the questionable but what we are very clear uh, if ultrasonogram shows fatty liver next step we have to try to find out the precipitating factor if you identify one or more than one precipitating factor so we have to take a steps to correct the factor then the fatty liver will be a reversible yeah joy you know one more point in addition to your what you said when there is a fatty liver there are certain places where there is a epical cardiac fat also so fatty liver patients also have epical cardiac fat so they do a mr imaging to see whether there is a, a epical cardiac fat also there now i'll come to sedu sedu what about uh, alcoholic hepatitis you know we are talking about non alcoholic hepatitis what about all- yeah i think uh, i'll i'll give you two very uh, interesting points alcoholic hepatitis is it dangerous more dangerous? yeah yeah i think i'll give you two interesting points i think alcoholics yeah. will uh, uh, will not note my point because it's a genetic disease now we see if you are coming back from the hospital at 10:30 and if you are crossing some 10 15 bars you can see large crowd today it is a standard of uh, you know relaxation that uh, it's now what is the amount of alcohol required to cause alcoholic liver damage is genetically dependent and not everybody gets a disease this is number one we might see lot of uh, fatty livers and uh, second point is ash and nash or a combination one so alcohol is a genetic disorder alcoholic liver is, is a you know different disease ball game all together and nash and ash this is one problem which we are seeing i'll give you the clinical phenotype of classical clinical phenotype is um, you know 40 50 year old fairly obese with a bmi of uh, 30 34 and then he is an alcoholic and he is a diabetic you know family history of diabetic i think this is a fertile fellow who would land into severe liver trouble even heading towards transplant and earlier we thought fatty liver is a simple as joy pointed out some of these fatty livers lead to hcc at a later date and even and uh, they may not even get fibrosis at all i mean though we said uh, there are two conditions now which we realized 
HBV is one condition, HCC can spontaneously develop. And today we realize NASH is another condition where you don't need fibrosis and significant damage, but you can still get HCC. So all our worry when you see a fatty liver, suddenly we think of an SOL and worried about it. But what is also the last point which I want to make is, if you can detect fatty liver early and fibrosis early, I think both of them tend to be reversible. As uh, it was pointed out, severe degree of fiber, F3, F4 may not be reversible. But if you can pick up F1, F2, uh, for example, this is what lesson we have learned with uh, in, in intervention. Stopping of alcohol alone can reduce the fibrosis. We are also looking at the most exciting Indian drug, saraglitazar, in fatty liver. And there is a paper which was published even the hepatology a couple of months back talking about the benefits of SARA glitazar. So we were quite impressed with that kind of thing. And we actually start using all this. Uh, yeah, Mohan, you, you want to say something? Uh, yeah. SARA glitazar is a very good drug for diabetic dyslipidemia. And we use them, uh, you know, unfortunately, it is an Indian uh, origin drug. So that's why it's internationally not picked up. We had uh, so many international papers, but still they have not taken up. But uh, all said and done, in a diabetic dyslipidemia, SARA glitazar does have a very good role. Mohan, please go ahead. Sir, in fact, uh, you people only uh, showed us first that, uh, you know, as you are using saroglitazar for, uh, uh, you know, dyslipidy, diabetic dyslipidemia, you also showed improvement in NASH and uh, then only the hepatologist picked up. Today, you know, like multicenter trials uh, with Arun Sanyal, Naga Chalazan, the entire group is on. Saro trials are on in the US. Very soon, I think 2023, it will conclude and 24 the publications will come on that. So that's okay. a good news. And we are all, as I'm sure Setu, Joy, everybody is using Saro, you know, right, left and center because it's a drug, you know, like which goes through the PPAR alpha delta pathway, alpha gamma pathway, whatever. And, uh, you know, it not only takes care of steatosis, also takes care of steatohepatitis and also, you know, takes care of fibrosis, all three levels to some extent fibrosis. But what is more interesting today in NASH fibrosis, we have OBT colic acid also available today, so which can reverse fibrosis. So I think uh, the fibrosis is the key because people are very clearly shown if there is fibrosis, F3, F4, then the you know longevity of the individual comes down. The mortality rates go up over a period of a decade, and again HCC rates go up. So the life itself the, you know shrinks if somebody has high fibrosis. So fibrosis is the key today and reversing fibrosis is the key to, you know, like give a better uh, healthy liver. So be it alcoholic liver disease, be it non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, be it hepatitis B, be it hepatitis C. What has also been shown very well, like uh, what Setuji was pointing out, a uh, typical case where, uh, you know, with uh, metabolic syndrome, obesity, and then also taking alcohol. Previously, people thought, you know, like uh, Mattioni gave in 1980s, that if somebody consumes a quarter of a whiskey brandy, rum, gin, arak, taking a, a proof of a spirit of 60 grams every day for five to eight years, liver becomes solid like a rock. It becomes fibrotic, cirrhotic, and then starts going through all the changes like uh, shrinking and then hepatocellular carcinoma decompensation. Today, 2020 articles are beautifully shown that in obese fatty liver guys, if they consume two larges three times a week, two larges three times a week, they can develop irreversible fibrosis in five-year time. That has been well shown. So these combo packs always work, uh, you know, drastically in liver, like uh, be it hep B plus hep C or uh, nafil D plus hep C, nafil D plus hep B, nafil D, nafil D combo, all these are, Really, really bothersome. So today, I think we'll all have to check for fibrosis. If, you know, like it's not possible to do fibrosis uh, using a fibro scan today, some of the ultrasound machines also have. And then you have, you can use a simple, you know, like NAPL D fibrosis score and FIP4 score, which can also give you a rule in and rule out to diagnose uh, uh, advanced fibrosis and immediately start putting them on lifestyle modification apart from, uh, you know, stopping up, uh, you know, alcohol and things like that, I'm sure it will work one day. Morgan, what is the drug you said which will reverse uh, fibrosis? What is the drug? Uh, Say it again. Obiticolic acid, sir. It's a bile acid. Obiticolic. Okay. 
okay now you know we, we are coming to the last part of the game i am going to ask each one of you one one question and then last will be your comment drive home message now we'll start with uh, sedu babu you were saying something i mean you raised your hand sedu what is your uh, comment i think uh, the what uh, vgm said about the combination of alcohol plus obesity plus one of the virus seems to be a dangerous combination for all of us um, alcohol plus obesity and diabetes now are the standard of uh, cases which come to us and interestingly the, if you can really guide them and counsel them their longevity is much better with controlling the alcohol or stopping alcohol reducing the obesity and getting the metabolic control their survival benefit or transplant free survival that is one of the word commonly used um, you know you can have actually a transplant free survival even if you have some amount of fibrosis you can have a reasonably well compensated from you know decompensation to recompensation and survival benefit seems to be standard of care because all patients cannot uh, transplant so easily availability multiple factors which uh, join can actually say so i think what we are looking at the take home message from my side would be no no i will ask you that la- last question okay. yeah now the last round of questions first chedu i will start with you we when, the, when we were students we used to see lot of amoebic liver abscess do you get amoebic liver uh, any any problem now any amoebiasis sedu yeah i think uh, uh, it it's now very rare we now put an amoebic liver abscess for a demonstration but uh, then when we asked the government hospitals uh, you know when we asked, they have seen these liver abscess and the basis very simple if somebody comes with a liver abscess my first question is how much you drink there is okay. one more small group very small group pregnancy pregnancy amoebic liver abscess is more but that is very uncommon because of the hygiene and other things so it is not seen in uh, you know high end hospitals but it is seen in government hospitals very rare but i agree and one more thing is the moment he gets a small diarrhea like illness which could be the initiator they take metronidazole and probably that is a preventive dose which they are doing i don't i agree okay. with your question wonderful yes. question do you uh, see yeah. amoebic liver abscess i don't see them much okay yeah. mohan mohan Uh, the same uh, adding on to say to this comment somebody was asking see amoeba in the natural habitat is intestine so in the liver if it goes it's going to die that is not its natural habitat so why does it go and uh, you know the comment was probably it takes the alcohol which is drunk by the human being goes amok and goes through the portal <laughs> circuit to the liver to bury itself was a comment one of the comments given long back by one of the seniors who's no more now a physician <laughs> i don't know i don't know you know even people are crazy i saw one of the newspaper on the whatsapp they take this uh, condom the flavored condom not the extras not for any sexual purpose they put it in the water and then drink and they get uh, high because they say the flavored uh, uh, condom the, the plastic when it goes uh, degradation it produces uh, some high uh, alcohol like thing and then they get uh, high so so many fantastic things people uh, try innovatively and then you know get it uh, this one because uh, the sales of uh, flavored condom has gone up by so many people i mean were giving this statistics uh, sir murugananand sir one request see sunday you are moderating a public uh, seminar on yeah. world hepatitis day i would yeah. appeal to you not to mention this because <laughs> otherwise our also will start all this so okay. we're going to the He's talking about prevention he is talking about yes. Yeah, I am prevention. talking about the prevention only. Prevention. Okay. Prevention. No, no. My my last question to Jai. We see lot of transplants happening, and the people giving. Uh, I mean, for example, my own, uh, uh, you know, colleague had a liver problem, and then uh, his son, seventeen-year-old son, gave the uh, I mean, donor. So how often? I mean, how long it take for the donor to regenerate his liver if he gives the uh, uh, donation? Uh, the donor age should be uh, 18 above and uh, 50 below normally and uh, and there are the other parameters we will look into that who will be the ideal donor or suitable donor uh, that time if the all the investigations comes favor to donate then after removing even though right lobe that means 60 to 70% of the liver the liver will regenerate almost 90% of the liver will regenerate in in a 
within a month time i mean at the end of one month so that kind of the capacity so we have to be very careful to choose the patient we shouldn't choose the uh, fatty liver or if the patient have the some other comorbidity so that time uh, the like a diabetes etc that time even though appearance lft everything shows normal the liver regeneration will not be the, the optimal not only to the donor in the recipient patient side also so normally liver regeneration time is comes around in one month and almost close to 90% will regenerate rest of the another two months time it will completely will regenerate regeneration okay. the meaning the weight of the liver and the volume of the liver so that is the the regeneration yeah. hyperplasia and hypertrophy yeah because many people have that doubt you know once you give a donation whether it will get back so this is a very good news that's why now the youngsters you know they are now giving a donation to his parents it's i think it's a very good uh, thing now last question to vijayam you are having a fibro scan machine so what do you, what is the maximum uh, cases you get in a fibro scan what are the diseases you get by doing fibro scan uh sir uh, i i use use it in all the four areas chronic hepatitis b chronic hepatitis c non alcoholic fatty liver disease alcoholic liver disease in the alcoholic liver disease i use this to threaten them say i tell them see you already developed advanced fibrosis you cross f3 you gone to f4 so now unless otherwise you reverse you please uh, make about 30 lakhs of rupees ready so that you go to joy for uh, liver transplantation otherwise you will die so then immediately he takes it seriously and tries to stop alcohol that way also once he stops alcohol and then uh, you know after 3 months and 6 months we repeat the fibro scan we have shown fibrosis reversal so beautiful same thing happens i use in non alcoholic fatty liver disease obesity metabolic syndrome where uh, dyslipidemia uncontrolled diabetes obesity and all these problems together and uh, then i show them that this is a fibrosis level this is a fat content we also quantitate fat today with the fat cap control attenuation parameter usually it has to be below 230 decibels if it is more that means more fat is there tell them see your liver is full of fat now you will have to modify your lifestyle so there was a beautiful question uh, mega dubey had put up in the chat box so can i make my liver happy by a lifestyle modification absolutely yes you can make the liver very happy by modifying your lifestyle one is but actually mohan i am going to ask that question that mega is my secretary only not a person is a mega dubey is my secretary she is calling from delhi oh. my secretary in delhi okay oh. mega i am going to ask that question to um, uh, mitra mitra tell me overall we are talking about various things how do you protect the liver when you love the liver how do you protect what are the drugs to be avoided what are the diet to be avoided and what diet can add to soothe the liver please so uh, the main uh, thing in a non alcoholic fatty liver disease would be uh, weight loss so the prime way to achieve a weight loss would be your lifestyle modification be nutrition diet and a combination of nutrition and uh, with exercise. exercise so nutrition wise uh eating um, a, a very balanced diet so your plate if you take a full plate i usually advise the patient saying 40% should be with uh, fruits and vegetables in your plate around 10% of the portion can be allowed for fats and the other 25 25% of the portions uh simple healthy carbohydrates and pro, uh, proteins so this would be uh, constituting a balanced diet for us so stay away from junk food if you want junk food then keep it at the top of the pyramid we follow the mediterranean pyramid so less than a uh, less than once a week so that would be for all the refined carbs and high fat diet and uh, with this diet we have uh, diet plus exercise exercise we would say 30 to 45 minutes per day for 5 days of um exercise of moderate intensity which would mean you split the exercise one third into isotonic one third into isometric and one third into aerobic so if you do that for five days a week this plus this and we also uh, find very good results with intermittent fasting 
a state of uh, 14 to 16 hours of fasting and the rest of uh, a fed state. So all of this can easily, very easily, they're showing results to reverse, um, at least to reduce the weight, at least 10% of body weight within six months in patients. And that has been shown to reverse even advanced fibrosis. So a 10% weight loss maintained over two years will even reverse fibrosis. So this seems to suffice for the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or metabolic syndrome subset patients. For alcohol, uh, once they develop an alcohol liver disease, definitely stop. Alcohol is the only thing we can advise. We cannot even advise a moderation in alcohol. And uh, smoking also we have to take into consideration. So I yeah. think the combination of all of this should be uh, and yeah. hepatitis B vaccination. So all of these and probably again hepatitis A and B, e, maintain your food safety measures and water safety measures then this would be a wholesome way to protect yeah. your... Also, as far as possible, what are the drugs to be avoided? We must also consult the doctor. Chronic drugs like amiodarone, which should be avoided. You know, those things only will protect their liver. Oh, Only thing about your intermittent fasting, uh, in a diabetic patient, you should be very careful. You must ask the diabetologist before you go for intermittent fasting. Just don't go for intermittent fasting in a diabetic patient. So now last round of uh, final message. Joy, you are allowed only one message only. And uh, you stop with uh, 20 to 30 seconds. Tell me your final message, round one message for the audience. Mm -hmm. Regarding the liver. So, uh, this is the World Hepatitis Day. And we should, uh, those who are so far not screened for Hepatitis B virus or C virus, better to do one time the screening. And in case if the Hepatitis B is negative, better to get the vaccination, the three doses of uh, the Hepatitis B vaccination. Second, ultrasonogram, one time you can go ahead. And if it shows the fatty liver, then better to try to find out the precipitating. What are the factors are there? Try to find out. And Jai, Jai, I said only one message because we have to give chance to them because Mitra wants to say about the ultrasound. You already said that. Okay. Now we'll go to uh, uh, your message is, you know, screen for um, uh, hepatitis B antibodies. Yeah, correct. Now, uh, uh, Sayed Babu, you are one message. I think uh, control your diabetes. Stop alcohol or at least find out with your doctor what is safe alcohol for you. Yeah. Morgan? Yeah, in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the cardiac mortality is higher. If you see all the death rates, it's more because of cardiac disease than even the liver. So that is a lot of publications on that. And also in diabetic NASH, the, the time the, there is a doubling of the you know NASH and fibrosis, hepatocellular carcinoma, cirrhosis rates are double in poorly controlled diabetics. So control diabetes perfectly, keep the lipid the levels down, and please check for the heart problem, you know, in these people with the metabolic syndrome. Otherwise, cardiac mortality could be high. Yeah, uh, Titra. So uh, your final message. Practitioners or not all cirrhosis or not all um, uh, you know mort uh, cirrhosis could be a, a, a CT image proven cirrhosis should always be looked into. But there are there are a number of other causes that uh, are coming into light which all could have the same uh, presentations. So not all decompensations are cirrhosis. So please look into all of that. Always rule out bacteria and other reversible causes also. Excellent. I think uh, I take this opportunity to thank all the stalwarts, you know, Joy, uh, Sedhu, Mohan Prasad. I, I think Mitra is now really a budding uh, hepatologist and we are very happy. We learned so many new points about liver. We have covered most of the points, including hepatitis, hepatoma, then carcinoma, everything we have uh, learned. And this video, I mean, this uh, webinar will be uploaded in our website. So those of you who missed also can leisurely go through and then get those uh, videos back. And if you have any doubt, please put your uh, questions in our chat box. Sedu will be always happy to answer any question and BGM is also with us. And we are looking forward to meet all of you in another uh, webinar. Uh, if you are, if you are, somebody is not uh, medical, like um, uh, our my secretary, please join on 31st. We are going to have one more uh, webinar for public. 
because public health uh, education is very important. We are going to do with the Rotary, Morgan and myself, and all. Uh, of course, Sedu also can speak double, so we can involve right, Sedu yeah. also. Yeah, Surely, so sir. Can, yeah, yeah, it's a good thing. So good, good. I am very happy. Uh, protect the liver, and liver is more important, like your heart. Uh, kidneys uh, also important, but at least you have two kidneys, but you have only one liver. Please bear in mind, and you know, uh, protect your liver, love your liver, and uh, take all precautions. And prevention is better than cure. Self hygiene, lifestyle modification. Avoiding alcohol, avoiding substance abuse, avoiding unnecessary prolonged drugs will cure, I mean, will support your uh, liver and protect liver. Thank you for joining. And uh, I take the opportunity to thank uh, uh, VGM technical staff for a, you know, trouble-free uh, video, I mean, trouble-free uh, uh, um, uh, program. Yeah. Yeah. Normally, we'll have some troubles, but there is no trouble at all, absolutely. I'm using only mobile phone in Bombay it was quite clear and nice. So thank you very much. Uh, once again, uh, Chad Babu, we look forward to meet sir. you. Yes, sir. And then, yes, sir. Uh, and then uh, we'll have some more uh, interesting uh, discussions on this uh, yes, uh, gastroenterology. Fine thank moment. You. Thank you. Good night. Uh, Good night, all of you. Thank you so much, uh, Muruganathan, sir. As usual, with a vibrant and brilliant, uh, you know, with a uh, with touch of humor. A beautiful uh, moderation of the whole session. Thank you so much, Setuji, and thanks to Joy, and uh, thanks to Mitra, and uh, my hearty thanks to Dr. Reddy's Laboratories for supporting, uh, giving us an educational grant for this webinar. Thank you so much. Thanks uh, to all of you who joined us today. So be safe uh, as far as your liver is concerned, and if you keep uh, your liver safe, your life will be safe. So all the very best. Good night, friends. See you soon in another webinar. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye. Thank you. You can stop live streaming. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mohan. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much.